Hello and welcome to part two of the Local Writers Read September event. Our theme this month is shadows and we have three more fantastic readers coming to you today. Um, we had a great start to the readings last night. Um, so if you didn't get the chance to see those, be sure to go back and check that out on Facebook or YouTube. Um, and we are here with our readers and our, the co-organizer, Claire Guyton, and we have Courtney back from Quiet City, um, who Thank it's you. lovely to have here again. Um, if you're new to the series, Quiet City Books in Lewiston has been a supporter and host and home for the series from the very beginning. Um, and we're also co-sponsored by the Lewiston Public Library. So we um, always want to thank them as well for the support and um, the promotion and just the encouragement of the arts here in Lewiston. Um, so we have, as I said, three readers with poetry and prose coming today. And so I will turn things over to Claire to introduce our readers today. Thank you. First, Lynn Schmidt will share her poetry with us. Lynn is new to Local Writers Read and we're excited to have her with us. Lynn is the award-winning author of the chapbooks Gravity and On Becoming a Role Model. She's a mental health professional with a focus in trauma and healing and is the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. When given the choice, Lynn prefers the company of her three dogs and one cat to humans. Next, we'll have Deborah Martin, a friend of the series who will share a flash fiction. Deborah lives in Kittery Point and writes short fiction, flash fiction, and creative nonfiction. She holds a master's degree from Boston University and spent many years working in public policy in Washington, DC. Her work has appeared in Parenthesis Journal, Storgy Magazine, Typishly, and Microfiction Monday, as well as in the anthology, Everywhere Stories, Shore Fiction from a Small Planet, Volume 3. And Dennis Kamari will finish us off with some new poems. We're welcoming Dennis back to the series as well. Dennis teaches writing at CMCC and UMA and is the founder of the Portland Poet Laureate Program. His poems have been featured in Poetry East, Mid-American Review, Spoon River Review, Maine Public Radio's Poems From Here, and the Press Herald's Deep Water series. In 2017, Dear Brook Editions published his second book, Combed by Crows. So without further ado, let's get started. Lynn, you have the stage. I always forget to unmute myself. Um, so I'm going to be reading poetry today. Um, and the first poem I have is oversimplification. Um, the tidbit about being the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor is very relevant to this poem. So that helps to give it a little bit more context. Adam, a grandson, said it was easy, referred to the torture as the writs of camps, suggested that being torn from your home, from your family, given rags for clothes, hardened wood as shoes, forced to work while bodies dropped around you, breathing in ashed air, was easy. For a time, because he's older and knows more, I buy into the idea that, well, maybe it wasn't that bad. But then the documents are found, camps are named, Buchenwald, Raven's Book, erected, arrested at 18 years, shipped against her will between various camps and forest screaming, forest screams singing out in broad daylight. Adam has lived in his Bopsha's house almost his entire life. And I wonder if he says it was easy because he can't figure out how to get out. I wonder if he says it was easy only because she survived. Thank you. Um, the next poem I have um, was written, um, one of, uh, a friend of a friend was recently murdered by her husband and it didn't sit well with me how it was reported um, because as media tends to do, it talked about how great this man was and how great he was for the community. Um, and it, it really shamed this woman and, and made her responsible for her own death. Um, and it really bugged me. And so I wrote this poem about it. It's called The Day After She Goes Missing. They find her body the day after the missing person's alert goes out. The newspapers will write about how her husband was such a loving man. He donated money, time, energy. He was the all-star student and they were high school sweethearts. They smiled in every one of their pictures on social media. 
And while the papers are so busy glamorizing this man with his wife's blood still wet on his hands, they will fail to report the outbursts, the screaming matches, the fists through walls, fists near faces, bruises on bodies covered by clothes, the things that eclipse what a good man is. They won't tell us about the hospital visits, the desperation to get away, the dancing on eggshells to make sure everything is perfect and the apologies and promises of, I swear I'll change this will never happen again and the want to believe it. After they find her body, the newspapers will only tell us of the great man and the woman who went back to him. Um, is it okay? Do I have time for two more poems? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the next poem um, was written just recently and published in Glass Poetry. It's written after the poem, Taking Off Emily Dickinson's Clothes. So if you guys are familiar with that, it'll give some context. And if not, um, here's this poem for you anyway. Um, the title is Necrophilia. Years after you're dead, they will still spend time trying to remove your dress. Still spend time exploring your corpse as it lays still because though you should have the liberty to rest in peace, they feel entitled to the pieces of your body, still. In life, I'm sure you would have written about them, demolished them like a building would have bitten them with your teeth, taken out chunks of skin and swallowed them whole. They attack you in death because here you won't scream, won't breathe, won't be able to defend yourself like the drunk women they find behind dumpsters. But she was allowed to be drunk and you are allowed to be dead. They will tell us that when it happens, you are a little wide-eyed as they strip you down, mistaking flesh decayed corpse sockets for eyes. The men will praise this act of necrophilia, offering awards and congratulations on the accomplishment, see the beauty in violating yet another woman, the perceived gentleness of the unbuttoning. And the women will realize, living a real-time horror story, that even in death, we still aren't safe from being raped. Um, and so the last poem I have for you today is Salem, Massachusetts, 2019. <clears throat> uh, this, book, uh, this poem is actually featured in my chapbook on becoming a role model, which is for sale at Quiet City Books, who does contactless orders, by the way. Um, so Salem, Massachusetts, 2019. My niece asked the tour guide how they used to hang the witches. How did they get them to that tree branch? The tour guide offers options. A ladder kicked out from beneath, a rope over a strong limb while strong men pulled the world out from under their feet. Sometimes the neck broke. Sometimes the victims struggled to put their fingers between the neck and the rope in hopes of oxygen. Most times they weren't witches, just poor people, eccentric people, people who decided to have a voice. My niece is six years old. She knows nothing of the world yet. And I will show her that they can't hang us all. Thank you. And next up, we have Deborah Martin. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a story that was inspired by crossing the international date line. Uh, it might make it into a collection of short stories that I'm working on. It's um, compact enough so that uh, I can read the whole thing. Crossing the line. When the pilot announced the crossing of the international date line, Sophie breathed a sigh of relief. She'd lost a day, moved from June 7th to June 9th without experiencing June 8th for one second. The day she lost wasn't just any day. It was the first anniversary of the worst day of her life. She'd sworn she'd never live those hours again and constructed a plan to guarantee she would not. The creators of the time zone system had provided her a reasonable alternative to a life of therapy. Sophie left Los Angeles on June 7th, planning to arrive in Auckland, New Zealand after 13 hours of flight, none of which would occur on June 8th for the eighth would disappear upon crossing the date line. She was determined to make similar trips each year and thankful she possessed the financial resources to do so, thanks to a well-funded life insurance policy from her passed away love. Sophie would not return to Los Angeles right away. 
a trip that would a trip that would gain a day, a different day. Instead, she would continue west through Dubai and Madrid before returning to her new apartment in Los Angeles. Her tension headaches subsided and she drifted into deep sleep. Sophie looked away from the Pacific when the plane descended, descended into Auckland at 10 a.m. She hated the water. She stuck close to other passengers, funneling through immigration and customs, but exited the terminal alone, crossing taxi lanes to the hotel shuttle stop. A waiting minibus whisked her to a hotel one mile from the terminal. At the desk, she registered for one night, informed the staff her flight to Dubai was scheduled for 6 a.m. and requested a wake up call at three. There was no need for a longer stay, no need to repeat excursions made long ago when she was carefree and somewhat careless. The years before love swept her into a different life, one she'd learned to treasure only to lose. She was 40, practical, and now focused only on pushing her way through the maneuvers her mission required. After a three hour nap and a very long shower, Sophie found her way to the hotel restaurant. She maintained eye contact with the menu rather than human beings, glancing briefly at the waitress when she ordered fish and chips and a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. She found the waitress much more enthusiastic than necessary. Sophie studied her phone while she ate, searching for information about the hotel at the Dubai airport. There was a spa in the hotel, and she planned to submit to a manicure, a pedicure, a facial, possibly a massage, to be rubbed in various ways and to think about nothing. After dinner, Sophie returned to her room and dozed, hugging one of the large pillows, until the phone rang and the robotic voice in the receiver instructed her to rise. She craved Eggs Benedict for breakfast unworried about fats or calories, because she routinely walked long distances on the treadmill while conducting business on her hands-free phone. But the hotel cafe was dark. She steadied a cup of coffee from the lobby as she rode to the terminal, where she gobbled a cinnamon roll before proceeding down the jetway for her 17 and a half hour flight. Only seven hours would be gained as the plane propelled its way through seven imaginary time pockets. Sophie disembarked in Dubai, collected her baggage, and rolled it to the International Hotel minibus. Checking went smoothly, as did most aspects of her life. Sophie rose from another nap and rode the elevator to the rooftop restaurant. She chose a table in the far corner and ordered an Indian-inspired chicken dish. Another woman entered and sat near Sophie, chattering and quizzing her about her plans. You mustn't pass through Dubai without seeing anything. What time is your flight? There's a bus tour of the city specially designed for people on long layovers. Next time, responded Sophie, wishing the woman would shut up. Sophie gazed at the Dubai skyline from her hotel room, grateful there was no water view. In lieu of taking the bus tour, she queried the internet for knowledge about Dubai. She arranged her spa appointments and later that evening returned to the terminal. Sophie was calm in the midst of the chaotic departure lounge. She observed men wearing kefias of various colors and designs, and men dressed for pilgrimages, barefoot, wearing sheets that covered their genitals and stretched diagonally across their chests. Religions were interesting, but not useful to her. Sophie studied the women in the security line. Many wore niqabs, hijabs, and burqas. An official directed Sophie to wait with three others next to a closed door. Another woman wearing yards of flowing black emerged when the door opened. She pulled up a sleeve and pointed to her gold bracelet to mime the reason for her detention. Sophie entered the room to be frisked, assuming, assuming her titanium hip the culprit, the replacement for the joint that ceased to function after hiking in Nepal. She stared into the shrouded agent's eyes for that was all she could see and wondered if the eyes were actually feminine but remained unfazed during the thorough search, which she thought might resemble a virginity test. When it was over, she moved to the gate and boarded the plane for Madrid. Sylvia had visited Madrid many times before and knew it well. She took the escalators down to the Metro and boarded a car to El Sol, changing trains twice, and checked into a small familiar hotel before walking to a cafe for a meal. Her spirits were lifted by the activity of mimes and musicians in the street. 
She ate salad and calamari and drank red wine, watching families and tourists and professionals pass. She shook her head when vendors stopped by her table and signaled the waiter to shoo them away. She ordered a second glass of wine when she finished her meal and turned her face to the sun. She felt a sense of accomplishment. She'd done what she'd intended to do. A man at a close table raised his glass to toast with her. She responded in kind. He asked how long she would be in Madrid. She said she would leave the following day and asked if he were staying longer. He said he was in the midst of a week's vacation before returning to work for the entire summer. He was a professional diver, always near water, happy to be taking vacation where he could wear cotton rather than rubber. Sophie's hands shook as she pulled money from her purse and put it on the table. She told the man to have a nice week and hurried down the pedestrian alley, leaving her glass half full. She regretted her rudeness, but couldn't explain. Evacuation was the only answer. There was no way the man could know that Don had convinced her to go scuba diving following her company's annual meeting in Belize. They were both certified divers, but it had never been a passion for Sophie. There was something claustrophobic about having to breathe through a tube. Don was a natural and never seemed affected by the changes in pressure and nitrogen. She agreed to take a few days off and counted it as a compromise that would keep their relationship close and fresh and fun. Don was the only one who could make her switch off her workaholic nature, and she needed someone who could do that. He kept her life in balance, kept her from becoming the sort with no time for emotional intimacy, the sort who allowed relationships to be trumped by an overriding sense of responsibility. She did not think about work when she was with Don. She relaxed and enjoyed every minute life offered. After two years, things remained passionate between the two, and she thought that would never change. There was a morning dive and the possibility of a night dive. The morning dive was lovely. Rays, turtles, schools of electric blue fish, eels, huge starfish, and corals. Sophie was entranced by the shapes and colors, but didn't enjoy listening to the sound of her own breath. She would have preferred classical music. But when Don said he wanted to experience his first night dive, Sophie agreed to be his buddy. The group of seven exited the boat, the dive master leading the trail of flashlights. Sophie and Don were at the rear. Sophie could hear her heart beating underneath the sound of her breath, both seeming louder in the dark. Before she could address, adjust to the new rhythm, she began to float toward the surface. Don, examining a creature behind a pointy rock, failed to notice. Sophie was on the surface quickly, despite fighting the ascent. She was surrounded by blackness. She could make out the flashlights below, but when she tried to dive to them, she couldn't submerge. Her gear had not been weighted properly. She tried five more times, wondering what Don was doing, wondering if he knew where she was. She was alone in the dark, floating easily, feeling uneasy. She turned on her flashlight and aimed it toward her head. A hundred yards away, the lights of the dive boat flicked on, its motor started, and it approached to retrieve her. She sat on the boat for an eternal 20 minutes, waiting for the others to return. The group returned without Don. The dive master, surprised not to see him in the boat, said Don had signaled his ascent to check on Sophie. He never saw Don catch his regulator air hose on the rock and puncture it. He didn't know Don's backup regulator had malfunctioned. As Don was rising, he breathed, water, breathed in water and begun to choke. The dive master had already turned to the rest of the group, leading them away. Five minutes later, Don was struggling to swim, sinking, gone. The loss of Don was not the worst thing that ever happened to Sophie. She'd lost family and friends, some in their prime. She was in shock, but there was an odd, faint sense of relief gnawing at her brain, which she ignored. Watching the retrieval of Don's body was not a gigantic challenge because her business involved manufacturing materials for disaster relief. She'd seen awful accidents. Arranging to ship Don's body back to the United States wasn't the most difficult thing she'd endured for providing emergency response involved body bags and shipping corpses. 
in the end, the experience that made her question everything she'd been, everything she was, and everything she would be, was the phone call she had to make to Don's wife. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Dennis Kamir. Come, did I say that right? <laughs> Yep, you're good. You can hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read five or six short poems. And all of these poems are about dry stone walling. So I'm just going to take a minute um, and talk about that. As many of you know, dry stone walling is a way of creating rock walls without using any cement. So it's a real poetic type of craft. And about you know, 10 or 12 years ago, I saw a documentary on New Hampshire Public Television about the dry stone wall. And he's really a Zen master. And he was the way he was talking about dry stone wall in this documentary was beautiful. It was like listening to a poet. So I went out and bought his book in the company of stones, fell in love with it, and I just started writing poems in the voice of a dry stone waller. So I'm gonna read from this book, Stone by Stone, um, which I wrote about 10 years ago. And then I'm gonna read three short poems uh, from a, some new stone poems I'm writing, okay? So this first poem is, is, I guess it's a found poem. About half of it is his actual language, half of it is my language and paraphrasing of his work. So this first stone poem is just called Found Stone Poem. Mute as stone, the old saying goes, strike it lightly though, and it begins jabbering. Flip across other rocks and it talks to every stone it brushes along the way. And so in the clack, the clucks, our conversations, keeping me apprised of what's happening under my hands, but out of my sight. So now I can catch and correct unseen spaces when hearing a hollow sound as a stone goes down. And I know a stone is secure if it seats itself with the sound of an old deadbolt being thrown. For walling is like being a tour guide for a people who speak a tongue I don't know. Though by their tones, I can tell if I'm leading them where they want to go. This next one, he really speaks beautifully about gathering field stones in spring. And here's a quote. I have been fortunate to discover my place in the world by way of an intimate contact with Earth's offspring. So as many of you know, each spring, more stones from the fields. And it got to the point where, you know, these colonial settlers had stones after stones coming up year after year. And some of them called them Satan shoes because they figured the devil was keeping them from tilling the fields and being uh, creating rich harvests and whatnot. But anyway, this poem is about him gathering field stones, the dry stone waller on gathering field stones. Before the stones of eggs hatch feathered heads, or tadpoles eel from gelatinous embryos, field stones crown the brown thawing ground. And after decades of mid whiffing stones, I'm so smitten with my youthful exhumed and desiring like a child around puppies to lift each newborn up, turn them over and run hands over wet heads and torsos. That over supper, my wife does spy the young buck who long ago abruptly frost heaved her life. And that evening, she loves me so much that as I thrust up and, and up in lust, I'm like a rising stone given a second life. And I welcome hands 
gripping my schist hips. Before feet scamper the granite shoulders. And when it's over, one warm fingertip alights the forehead's cliff, slides down the face wall of the jowls. And like the lost white mountains, seems to go home is somewhere close. Now that she stares into that familiar old man on the mountain knows. This last one from the book is called The Dry Stone Waller Muses About Cosmology, Cosmology in the Galaxies. For God, stars and planets are like set stones whose poetic constellations balancing on nothing but the grace of gravity mark the line between human and divine. And we, like creatures in dry stone walls, thrive in the negative space between Earth and Moon, Venus and Las Vegas. Though, yes, true, like lizards, frogs, ice, we still fear being crushed by the errant meteor, or wonder, like chipmunks trembling to a waller's hammering, if it's a kind being behind this grand design, which sometimes frosties with tsunamis. So some days we seek the meek, we see the meek lowly snail as one of God's chosen people, as she carries the dirt home on her shoulders. And when retreating from the white light of probing's finger, finds her only hope in her molten body hardening into stone. And I'm just going to finish up with two work pieces from. So I, I wrote that book like a decade ago, and I've been revisiting this long stone poem I started about 10 years ago. Um, and again, it's in the same place of a dry stone waller. So I'm just going to read two or three short sections from it, the 10 sections of the poem. And it's called When One is Walled a Long Time All Alone. And for those of you who know Galway Canal's poetry, he wrote a poem called When One Has Lived a Long Time Alone. And that was a 10 sequence, 10, 10, 10 part poem. So I, I'm borrowing that rhetorical format. In his poem, he begins and ends with the same line, when one has lived a long time alone. What I'm doing is I'm beginning and ending with the line, when one is walled a long time alone. So every section, I know the first line and the last line, so I don't know why it's so hard for me to finish the poem. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna read two sections of this poem called, When One Has Walled a Long Time All Alone. And the first one just has a little definition to begin it. Um, and the word I'm gonna use is heartstone. And heartstone refers to the hidden, small stone packed between both sides of a wall in order to keep it balanced and tight. So every wall has a lot of heart stone packed. It's really doing the hard work and is unseen. And I thought that was very poetic. Okay, so when one has lived a long time, I'll, I'll walled a long time. I'll, I'll. When one is walled, a long time all alone. One grows so fond of lizard and frog, thriving in these low income adobe condos, that one's design is also inspired by a desire to provide grottos and spaces safe from foxclaw. So a wall's beauty, one note, is as beholden to a love for the blind mole as to any sacred Mayan ruin. And in providing these escapeways and dry lofts, one comes to see how walling the soul with this odd means of making its kindness known. Even through winter's raging snow, as one sleeps as peacefully as creatures, in knowing they burrow 
inside the spaces of one's unseen heart stone when one is walled a long time all alone. This next one. When one is walled a long time all alone, one notes earthworms rising nights to excrete their castings, which over centuries will bury the seemingly wall. So those surviving the scare and property disputes, the wall cannot escape the laws of mother nature. And so one sees the wall so far down the road as a mansion for the million plus earthworms working each acre below. And one feels in their boot sole sinking into mud from last night's downpour, the gravity of one's own mortality. So out of the worms, three hearts fueling the half inch of topsoil they create each year, all the while playing David to the Goliath of stone, one grows to accept the claim one feels in laying all the granite capstone. And one desires even more that green home burial in pine coffin, where the decaying walls draw so many worms to decompose like stone bones back into dirt and the god stuff of duff for the lovely earthworms. When one is walled a long time, all alone. All right, I'll keep it short and sweet like Lindy. That's it. Thanks. All right, mute myself here. Yeah, no, thank you all. Um, th that was a lovely set of work. Um, uh, yeah, poetry and prose both. And uh, I mean, as we so often see with these three, I think very different examinations of the same theme as a starting point. Um, and we keep saying this, but it's always it's so much fun to hear um, different people's entry points into the work and the, just the different things that they are writing about and examining. Um, so we're going to transition into a bit of time for Q&A and discussion. Um, so it, anyone who is watching along on the stream, if you have questions for any of our readers, feel free to drop those into the comments. Um, and we will be sure to address those. Um, there's a slight delay, but we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, but to kick off the discussion, Claire, I know you've got a couple questions for our readers as well. I always have questions for our readers. Um, <clears throat> Lynn, I'm going to start with you because that's how my little brain works. I have to go in the same order of the people who read or I get all upset. So. Um, we last night we were talking about how short story writers uh, tend to write about difficult, dark, painful things, and we were talking about why that is. Um, and we sort of landed on the idea that, um, or the belief that, uh, character sort of reveals itself best um, in those moments in life, and that's probably why we go there, and it's probably why we want to connect with those stories. But we didn't talk about what writing about difficult, painful things. Uh, does to the author of those things, like how that affects the writer. And it's something that I've thought about a lot in my work. Um, and I'm wondering if other people might be curious about it, especially non-writers who might be listening. Um, and I thought you might wanna talk a little bit about that in your process, given that you you know, obviously addressed a lot of tough things in your poetry. Yeah, um, so I, uh, I've been told that I write dark and twisty poetry. <laughs> Um, and I also write memoir, um, and I don't write happy things. Um, a lot of the times when I actually do poetry readings, I'll, I'll do the content warning and say, like, this is going to get intense. And if you need to leave, like, take care of yourself, I, I know this is hard. And I know it's hard because it was hard to write as well. Um, I... I've been in therapy pretty much since I was 18. Um, and a lot of that is taking the time to really digest your feelings and where they're coming from and how this manifests. Um, and so um, the, the chat book that I mentioned earlier on becoming a role model, 
um, I actually thank my therapists in the acknowledgements um, because it, it explores a lot of my childhood trauma. Um, I grew up in a really abusive household with a lot of substance use um, and, you know, the trajectory for, for people with my backstory, you know, a lot of the time deals with addiction, deals with self-harm, deals with mental illness and, and a lot of those stereotypes. And, um, so to, to be able to explore that and to put it on paper feels really important. Um, one of the best things that happens with my poetry or if, with my memoir, um, with the stories that I tell, is almost every single time I'll get a DM after a reading or people will come up to me, you know, back before COVID days um, and say, thank you. Like you just shared my story. And so many people will connect with something. And so it's both healing for me. And I also do it to try to help normalize those experiences as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I think um, just to comment on that briefly, it's always, I think, so striking for us as readers, like when you find a piece of art and it's that moment of realization that like somebody else has been or has thought this thing that I have been through um, is so reaffirming to come across that, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Deborah, not to just keep running my mouth, anyone else can jump in anytime, but I'm moving on to my next question. Deborah, um, when uh, we had Ann Elliott reading for us a while back, I commented on a line in her piece that was this really nice concrete detail that showed um, a lot about the character. And I mean, I immediately got an image of this character, a full, like a really full image that I knew that if, you know, if I continued to read that, it was part of a book, um, that I would be testing everything I learned about that character afterwards based on that little piece that she gave me. And I noticed that your piece had um, a line like that and it's my favorite line in, in it. Um, and it's a pretty short piece. Um, and it really stood out to me. And, and, it's, and it's not in the active, the action sort of portion of the piece. It's, um, it's where the narrator says, she found the waitress much more enthusiastic than necessary. And I feel like that says so much about that character. Like I sort of, I, I don't think it's just about her mood or, or state of mind that day. I think it's about her personality. And again, it makes me think about my own process and how oftentimes a story will not work. I cannot make the story successful until I learn something about the character that I didn't know yet. Um, and so I was just kind of wondering about your process of developing characters, how often you're choosing the right detail to show what you already know about the character and how often you sort of trip over a new knowledge about the character as you're writing. I would say that uh, I start with an idea of who this person is, um, but it changes dramatically as I go along. And I, I, I think it's more for the kind of line that you referenced, I think I kind of trip over it. It just comes out. Uh, I, in this particular case, um, the first version of this character had her maybe too much without any feeling at all. I mean, she's clearly a character who is very focused and goal oriented and serious, but doesn't stop to smell the roses along the way all that much. But uh, so I had to, I had to massage her to get her to be who she is today, but that, that line just, I don't know, just kind of came out. Like I knew, I knew that much about her Yeah. at that moment. And then that feeds what you know, and she grows into a more real person, maybe teaches you something else. Yeah. It's, it's a really fun and interesting process, I think. Yeah. It's definitely dynamic. It's definitely yeah. dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anyone else who'd like to jump in before I sweep through? All right, Dennis, I think I misunderstood something maybe in our exchange. I thought that you were um, preparing a new book to go to press soon. If I am wrong about that, well, if I'm right about that, please tell us a little bit about it. But I also do have a question that I'm really curious about, um, which is, 
what is it like to pull something out from 10 years ago and then encounter that work as your 10 year older self with 10 years more experience mm -hmm. and you know a, a whole new life and work on that material and pull at it, stretch it for, for something new or to inspire something new. I would love to hear you talk yeah. a little bit about that. That's a really good question, which I need to think about if I'm gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I started this long poem that I shared a couple parts with you 10 years ago as the book was going. And it didn't, you know, obviously it wasn't finished. I couldn't put it in the book. Um, and then I put it down for five years, which I often do. And I started working on it again five years ago. I'm like, oh, you know, there's something here. At some point, I have to work on this poem. And I worked on it, you know, off and on for a couple months. Then I put it down for another five years. And all that time, I, you know, I published another book. And um, so I do have another manuscript that I'm putting together. And just as I came really close to, putting the finishing touches on this new manuscript that I'm hoping to have done in the next three to six months, this big poem came back at me and I'm like, you know, I'd really like to put this long stone poem in the book as sort of like a centering poem, sort of like a grounding meditative, I mean, the book a modern uh, words of paradise. It's a play on birds of paradise. It's called words of paradise. And I have a pretentious colon and a subtitle, um, A Modern Book of Consolation. I'm, I'm going very, you know, European medieval, very anti-trendy, you know, I'm going totally against the grain of modern poetry, but you know, who cares, you know, I don't, I don't care. Um, so I'm putting together another manuscript and this long poem suddenly reared up and I said, you know, I wanna put it in the book. So I'm working on it, but to get back to, yeah, looking at what I wrote and, you know, there's some continuity. Um, you know, obviously there's that same dry stone waller voice and I'm really exploring character you know, to kind of connect with the fiction writers in the group. I'm really exploring this guy's character and I've developed a character and a way of looking at the world which is really a blessing. It's really meditative, it's really Zen, it's really peaceful. And you know, I don't know if the poems are any good but I feel better after I work on them. <laughs> well that's what it's what it's all about i mean that's what keeps you going sure. as a writer yeah. yeah sure that's amazing and so interesting um and i do another question came up for me while you were talking that i i can't resist posing uh when i was getting my mfa my favorite mentor told me one day if you write long enough you will pull out a story that you worked on years ago and you will not recognize it. You will read the entire thing and you will not recognize it. It will be as though an alien came down and wrote it and slipped it into your home and you have no idea where it came from and how you did that. And I thought, oh, come on, you know, something's wrong with this guy's brain. Of course I'll recognize anything I write. Mm -hmm. And it, it eventually happened to me. It has happened to me. And I'm just wondering if it, that's happened to anyone else here today. Mm. No, something wrong with my brain too. Yeah, I think your best poems, yeah, your best poems are stories when you know that something has entered you, you know what I mean? It's like in your body and, and sometimes when I'm working on something that I'm like, whoa, well, you know, every year, twice a year, I think so good. And it's almost like I, I, I delay finishing it because I don't want to lose that feeling. And so I, I write it down and then day if I go back it's, I, I, I liken it to dating first you have that initial whoa wow moment but then, like, hey, wait and see if that wow moment is still there tomorrow you know what I mean yeah but if it's there yeah. tomorrow you're like oh and then if you know you have something that might be good you almost want to delay finishing it because you don't want to lose that feeling so I think any really good piece you get you feel it's come from somewhere or there's some collaboration with your higher self or Gaia cosmos source, whatever you want to say. Yeah. Well, that is a delightful gloss in what I said, but I cannot swear that what I pulled out was any good at all. It, the, the shock was just that I didn't recognize it. 
whatsoever. I mean, even after I read the whole thing. Um, Courtney, you were going to say something. Yeah, I had to um, struggle to find where my unmute button was. <laughs> but yes, that has happened to me. I've been writing short stories on and off since I was a kid, basically. And they started um, being saved electronically in high school on my word processor, even though I'm old enough to have had our, a computer. I just didn't, I had a word processor with like a floppy disk. And then I found that floppy disk several years later after I was married and had my first child. And I think my mom still had a computer that was old enough to even read this floppy disk. And I, so I, I found some of my old fiction from my late teens and early twenties. And I was like, mm, no, thank you. <laughs> going to move on from that. <laughs> did you recognize it though? Like, did you remember the self that wrote it? I definitely remembered the self that wrote it and it was embarrassing really, you know, like I grew up very, um, like I'm a middle child. So very much like in my own world and I was a dreamer and kind of a loner. Like I had friends, but I spent a lot of time by myself reading and writing and daydreaming. And so my writing very much reflected the daydreamer part of me that romanticized everything and it was a little embarrassing oh it sounds sweet <laughs> it, it <laughs> might have been to other people <laughs> not myself <laughs> that's funny um if i can chime in uh as well with this topic um I have definitely had experiences where I've, I've gone back to something. So when I write, um, I'll like write like handwritten things and then type them off later. Um, so I have just a plethora of notebooks and sometimes I lose the notebooks for years. Um, I also um, type poems on my phone and email them to myself. So it's one medium or the other. And so um, I actually had to create a new file that says poems to type up later. Um, and so sometimes they just get lost in my email and I found one actually from two years ago um, that referenced my dog dying. And so like immediately, like I knew I had written it, but I had no recollection of ever having written it. And I was like, oh, this one isn't garbage. That's kind of cool. Put that in the folder. Um, and so it's, it's definitely interesting to like just write something, put it out in the world, completely forget about it, and then find it a year or two later with the knowledge, like, I know I wrote this, this has my name on it, this has that's something I experienced, but to have, it's very surreal to, to experience that. That's exactly the experience I'm talking about. It's, it's really strange, because you just can't remember ever having written a single word of it. Yeah, it's like somebody left it for you. It's just so strange. And actually, I did remember I can't believe this, but a minute ago, I remembered that I have done exactly what Dennis is doing. I have pulled something out that was 10 years old. And um, so I asked you that question. I was so curious about what it felt like. And it's because it didn't feel like it was 10 years. It didn't feel like it was 10 years later. I don't know how that feels, if that's right. sort of like that for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm writing it. It feels so, I don't know, there's something about this character and this project and it just gives me something. I'm receiving like something when I work on this and yeah, it just feels, it feels real still, I guess. So. Well, I'm, I'm jealous. I'm going to have to come out and write with you because I don't, I don't have that experience very often. And when I pulled mine out, well, I, I, it, was, it was not exciting. Yeah. It was just like, I just remembered and I was right back in the thick and the meanness and ugliness of trying to make a story work that I couldn't make work 10 years ago. I did make it work sort of, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was, in a, I, was in a, I was in a this summer writing in part because of the COVID isolation. And so I, I have a bunch of files. I mean, I only read 5% of what I write and I invariably throw out 90%. I just have files upon files. So when I'm not inspired, I go through these files. Yeah, well, like you said, once I clicked a file, I'm like, wow, I wrote that. That might be, and it went in my book and for some reason, poem that everybody likes, and I forgot I wrote it. Um, but I go through the files, and I was going through the files, and I found that poem in there, and I'm like, oh, there's still something here that I really want to, that that's alive to me. So it was really, yeah, it was really great. Really yeah. Well, for any writers or wannabe writers or 
people who've been really wanting to, to try to sit down and write a story or a poem and you haven't done it yet, I think what you're hearing from us is save everything. When you have an inspiration, when something is interesting to you, you have that little story idea, don't think one day I'll sit down and write that. Go actually put it in a Word document and save it because the next time inspiration strikes, you can pull it up and work on it. Not to mention I've lost so many ideas that I loved in the moment. I was like, I'll write these down, like even in yeah. an hour, I'll write it down when I get home. And I get home and I'm like, it is gone. Um, yeah, that's the same thing. I'm driving and it's like, oh man, that'd be a great poem. I get home, God, I can't remember it. And for hours, I'm just so frustrated trying to figure out what was it? Was it? Was I thinking of scissors or trees or bird? What was it? It's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. I've had that happen many times too. Shower thoughts, driving thoughts, cooking thoughts. Yep. One of my favorite <laughs> cartoons I see online is that thing. It's like, if you have an idea in the middle of the night, write it down. And then the next morning it shows the character sit up and staring at the snow and says, when the glove. And they're just like, what? <laughs> so good notes also make a difference. Yeah, that's true. There's a whole Seinfeld episode about that. Remember, yeah. he wakes up in the middle of the night yeah. and, writes the and he thinks it's hilarious. And then the next day, yeah. it makes no sense. <laughs> Speaking to the, the driving thoughts, um, one of the life-saving graces for me with that has been the voice memo app on the phone um, because like Siri can activate that. So you can totally just narrate to yourself um, and very genuinely, if it's safe, like find a spot to pull over and write it down. Um, some of my best poems have, have happened in those flashes and then there have been some that have definitely been lost because I wasn't in a good spot. Um, so, you know, building off of what Claire had said, like write everything down where you can and try to save it so you can go back to it for sure. Yeah. And one of the things I find interesting too is like, I'll have these ideas that seem fantastic in the moment and I'll write them down and then forget about them or like at least set them aside. And sometimes I go back and I'm like, this is not a good idea. <laughs> Um, and like all the magic is gone, but then there's other times I can come back and it's months or maybe years later and I still love the idea. And like, that's what tells me that maybe it has the legs to actually go somewhere is, I mean, like we're talking about with pulling out work 10 years later, if you're still excited about something, then I think that's a promise that there's really, a, I think a core to it that is worth exploring. Um, Cause yeah, I was starting to think, I don't know if I've ever pulled out a full story but I know I've done like notes and paragraphs and just recently I was going through some like novel idea notes and I found like a synopsis for a book that like Claire was saying, I had no, no memory of writing this thing. I was like, hey, this is a great idea. I should write this book someday. <laughs> it's in your handwriting. So you know you wrote it, but. <laughs> well, it, it was actually in a Google doc. So maybe okay. I'm being hacked by like an idea fairy, so. Oh, well, that's a nice idea fairy. Feed her well. <laughs> uh, Courtney, did you have anything else you want to say? Just qu either questions or the reading in general? Um, I, I don't have any questions really. I think I'm, I'm pretty familiar with all of your work from past readings. So I feel like I've gotten to know you all enough to have all of my curiosities sort of already fulfilled, but I, w I want to note that every one of your readings today were really powerful in very different ways. Um, Lynn always manages to get that like gut punch in almost every poem she writes. And I usually will read something that she's written and kind of just like stop and stare off into the distance for a little while, or she just makes me cry. And um, I really like the ending of Deborah's story, which was completely surprising and not what I was expecting. And then Dennis, your work, even though it was all, you know, rooted with like the earth and stones and worms and all of that stuff, it felt very, um, very daydreamy. And I really liked that aspect of it, that it, it made me want to go sit on a rock wall next to a field and some woods and like build a fairy house and just kind of make my own poetry and things so all of your readings today were wonderful and inspired me and made me really happy so thank you for all of that you do 
Very well said, and thank you guys too. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful. Yeah, and um, Dennis, we've got a comment coming in for you on Facebook from Jason. He's saying um, he he loves your new poems. So it sounds like things are definitely. Oh, good. Up. Yeah, Jason bought my book. I, it must be Jason Trask. He's a good yep. soul, man. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a he's a he's a he's a you know non-practicing Buddhist right now. <laughs> so he gets the Zen stuff in the poem. Good. Thank you. Dennis, when is your um, when are you planning to? get your new book out I, I've been revising it for two years and it's I've been saying it's going to be ready in six months for two and a half years okay so in six months I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah I mean I'm, I'm hoping to get it done by Christmas um, and then submit it or I don't know my, my current publisher probably would publish I don't know I, I until it's revised I'm just gonna, just gonna sit on it but yeah, I gotta get it done. So get on me. I don't know. Yeah, get on it. Come on. Come on, Dennis. I gotta, get on this. I, gotta I gotta do this. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that brings us to about time. So we will wrap things up. Um, Dennis and Deborah and Lynn, thank you for joining us. Um, and we want to give a shout out to um Darren and Renee from last night as well, all five of our readers. Um it's just it's so great that we can have um, main writers who are willing to just come together and to share work with us and with everyone who tunes in. Um, it's so much fun. And I know that we get so much out of it every time running this series. Um, Courtney, as always, thank you. Your support is a, a big part of why this series is even able to exist. So we're always happy to have you here. Yeah, thank um, you for all the work you do for organizing, you and Claire. And if you're listening and you need books, go or check out Quiet City on Facebook and buy all of Courtney's things because she has amazing books. <laughs> How can you not need books? Of course you need books. Everybody needs books. Everybody needs books in some way. Yes. Especially um, now. Yes. Yeah, so we will wrap up for now, but we will be back in October with another event. Um, and also next Friday, the 25th, check out LA Arts, where Local Writers Read will be pairing um, with LA Arts for their art walk to do another genre spotlight. So that video will be up as well. Um, thank you to everyone who tuned in. As always, these will be up on YouTube and Facebook and our website. So share them, go back, re-experience it all again. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. This has been great. Just make and one I more. Yeah, uh, Claire and Josh, the, my friend Jason, who's listening, is a wonderful fiction writer and nonfiction writer. So uh, I can give you his email. He would be wonderful. He just published a nonfiction uh, memoir about teaching on Rikers Island oh, wow. for wow. years. And he's also published, I think, two novels. Um, and Carolyn Shute loves his work so much that years ago she tried to get her agent to carry him. So there you go. I think I just sold them, right? <laughs> so you should, you should get Jason Trask to uh, to do one of these, right, Jason? If you're still there, I'm, I'm thinking about you. Like, <laughs> just send us um, send us the email. I will. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. So yeah, everyone, enjoy your weekend. Um, get out in the sunshine, and we will see you next time. Great. Right, cool. Thanks for having me. Bye. Good hearing all of you. Thank you. <laughs>